thanks everybody for coming out today. I'm here in Syracuse to uh, relaunch my campaign post-primary, and you're looking at Plan B for the half million voters who voted for progressive Democrats and lost in the statewide races. Uh, I think that's not just the Cynthia Nixon voters, but the Zephyr Teachout and Jemani Williams voters, because the ticket I'm running with, I believe, is the most qualified of any of the tickets that are running. Uh, my running mate, Gia Lee, is a public school teacher. She's one of the top organizers for uh, teachers around the country. She was involved in helping the teachers in Arizona, Oklahoma, and West Virginia in their recent strikes in so-called right to work states. She just spent a week in Puerto Rico helping those teachers and their union resist the total privatization of that disaster capitalism in the wake of uh, Hurricane Maria is being attempted to be imposed by the Trump administration. And so she's a special education teacher, a leader in the opt-out movement. Our candidate for Attorney General, Michael Sussman, he put his resume of litigation in state and federal courts against the Democrats, all of them that ran and the Republican, and his resume will dwarf theirs. And, and it includes landmark cases like the Yonkers desegregation case, the case that got a remedy for the black and Latino voters discriminated against by the civil service process. Uh, D.J. Henry, a black student from Pace University, murdered by a white cop that was not prosecuted. He got a $6 million civil service, uh, a civil court uh, uh, settlement for that family. And he's done public corruption, environment, election law, you name it. And uh, our candidate for attorney general uh, would be going into the office with more experience than Tom DiNapoli had coming out of the assembly. That's Mark Dunley. And we're running because the people in office, including Governor Cuomo, can't solve the simplest of problems. We got three primaries in New York State, April for the presidential, June for the federal, and state local in September. And they can't even find one day to have the primaries on. That's a simple problem. Another simple problem, 47 years after the Surgeon General issued an urgent warning to test the children for lead, treat them if their lead is elevated in their blood, and then remedy the problem, 47 years later, 40% of the children in Syracuse, 40% of the children in Buffalo, 38% of the children in Utica, and double digits in all of our cities have elevated blood levels that damages neurological development and permanently impairs the physical, mental, and emotional development of our children. Now, remediating lead is not rocket science, but we don't make it a priority, and the state by not sharing revenues and paying for its unfunded mandate, squeezes budgets like Syracuse so we don't even have the capacity to remedy the lead. Our building inspectors don't know how to find the lead and or test it and make sure it's uh, lead safe after it's been remediated. So these are basic problems. And those dwarf difficulty compared to the climate crisis or the growing polarization of income and wealth in this state, which creates cities like Syracuse, which is now the ninth poorest city in the country. So, I would also say we're not just plan B for the progressives who lost in those statewide races, those voters, but for what public opinion polls say, the majority of liberals think they're with Cuomo. And I think we're offering them a better option, and I hope we'll get the opportunity to present it. We're calling for four debates, not one debate dictated by Cuomo on a Monday night when there's a football game in Buffalo on PBS, like last time. We want four debates in four parts of the state, New York City, Capital District, Central New York, Western New York. I'll go for five. Let's have one on Long Island, too. And there should be a different topic so we can really get into the policy and the voters who know what their options are. The economy, government reform, climate and the environment, and then the social policies from housing and education to criminal justice and civil rights. And I would also say, I'm, you know, it's been frustrating. I hear Cuomo and Nixon debate, and I'm shouting at the TV giving my positions because in terms of progressive policies, I, I appreciate Cynthia Nixon trying to raise them, but she, we got to go beyond what she was raising. Take housing. She talks about extending rent control statewide because rent is too damn high, and it's growing faster in Buffalo than it is in New York, which has a notorious problem of the so-called affordable housing plan coming from the quote-unquote progressive Democrat, Mayor de Blasio, where the most affordable units in their plan, are, you have to have an income of $50,000. So working class is being driven out of Manhattan, out of many parts of Brooklyn, and it's being driven out of a lot of places. Homelessness has exploded under Governor Cuomo's uh, term in office. So she calls for rent regulations, but not for home rule. 
So we have the situation since 1971, the Earth State Law passed. So, you know, the guy from uh, Wayne County that represented the farmers up there for 26 years without opposition, his campaign was paid for by the real estate industry in New York, the vote on rent regulations in New York. We gotta have more home rule for our cities, including rent control, and then we gotta increase affordable housing. And public housing is the most cost-effective way to do that. These subsidies for private developers is not working. I did a whole news conference on the fiasco of tearing down 409 units at Kennedy Square, which was subsidized. It's a weed-strewn lot now, and they're building luxury apartments for wealthy students and professionals across the street. Education. She's, she was right to call for full funding, but she didn't call for desegregation. And what has happened since the courts have made it harder to desegregate racially is they've turned to high-stakes testing and this whole testing regime, which is about business, not education. The hedge fund guys can double their money in seven years. Juan Gonzalez did a well, uh, you know, a famous article for the Daily News in 2010 about what was going on in Albany, because they get a 39% tax credit under the New Markets Tax Credit, it's federal. And I went to look up that article earlier this year, and I found that uh, the first thing came up on Google was Investopedia telling people how to double their money in seven years because of that tax credit. That is not about education. It's a substitute for desegregation, which has been the most effective education reform we've had in the last, in our generation. Because when you desegregate, and we know from Gerald Grant, the professor, late professor at SU, whose daughter was teaching down in Raleigh, that the subtitle of this book, which is called Hope and Despair in American City, was Why There Are No Bad Schools in Raleigh. That's because they desegregated. The rest of the subtitle could have been Why All the Schools in Syracuse Are Bad, because we're segregated. And what he found was the test scores of the low-income students came up to the middle-class students. The middle-class students did as well or better, but all the students better did better on things like intellectual self-confidence, creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, teamwork, the kind of things that you want your kids to come out to be, you know, smart citizens and productive workers in the modern economy. So it's a better education, and nobody's talking about desegregation. We're talking about a little bit in New York City right now, the most segregated city in the country, but we know Syracuse is up there in the high rankings. And then another big issue was the climate change issue. And Nixon was promoting this bill called Community and Climate Protection Act, which really codifies Cuomo's energy policy. The only tweak is to get to 100% instead of 80% reduction of greenhouse emissions by 2050, which is too late. It says nothing about stopping crack gas infrastructure. If you actually read the bill, it says the goal is to get to 450 parts per million carbon equivalents. And the problem there is we need to get below 350 parts per million. James Hansen and these other climate scientists said that. Said that. And to do that, we got to get to 100% clean energy, zero emissions by 2030. So we're backing the bill called New York Off, Off Fossil Fuels, which not only provides a plan to get there, but says no new frack gas. So the bill that the Democrats, they passed it three times in the assembly, Nixon was talking about, says uh, we're going to get to Cuomo's goal of 50% clean electricity by 2030. That only cuts the carbon footprint of the state by 14%, because electricity is not the whole carbon footprint, it's only 28%. Meanwhile, it allows frack gas plants to go forward. Like that corrupt plant, competitive power ventures, greased with a bribe from the former uh, treasurer and national finance director of the Democratic Party, that was Peter Kel Galbraith Kelly Jr., to Joe Prococo. And that plant adds back 10% to our carbon footprint. So there's no progress under this bill, yet that was presented as a climate uh, action plan. So we're going for 100% clean energy by 2030 with the New York Off Bill. So I'm hoping we have these debates and we have an opportunity to present these policy alternatives so the voters can see what their real options are. And then the last thing I want to talk about uh, and lead into Frank Cetera, our candidate for uh, counselor at large here in Syracuse, is the state's finances. The top 1% in the state's share of income since 1980 has grown from 12% to 31%. Meanwhile, the rest of us are struggling to pay our bills and some of us can't pay the rent and that's why homelessness is exploding. The top 1% has $375 billion in income last year. If they just paid 10% more in income, those average, uh, those, that 1%'s average income annually is $4.5 million. So, okay, they pay another $450,000. They're going to whine about it, but they'll still be very rich. And we will have the resources we need 
to rebuild the public services and infrastructure of this state, from NYCHA housing and the MTA to getting the lead out of Syracuse and providing the services like for people with mental illness. We deinstitutionalize them, they go out on the street, and a lot of them end up in prison, they're not being taken care of because we've had this austerity since the 1980s. So we have progressive tax reform, revitalize the public sector, and that's, those are the public avenues of private commerce because we can lower the cost of living and doing business with health insurance, public power, public broadband, uh, single payer health care. And so that's the kind of program we're presenting. And now I want to introduce Frank Cetera, who like our statewide state running for city council, is probably the most qualified guy running that's not yet on the city council. Frank has been involved in all kinds of things in the community. This city is not solving its problems. Frank can bring solutions. And so Frank, why don't you come up and tell people what your solutions are for therapy? Thanks. Thanks, Howie. Uh, good morning, uh, residents of Syracuse and members of the press. I want to thank you for hanging out a few extra minutes with me here today. Uh, my name is Frank Sutera. I'm the Green Party candidate for the Syracuse at-large council position. And the reason why I'm thankful you're here today is because many people aren't aware that there is an open seat being uh, elected through special election this fall for the city council. That's the result of Helen Hudson obtaining the president's seat last year and opening that seat uh, back up. Now I campaigned and uh, worked to try to enable the public to have a say in the appointment of that seat, the temporary appointment of that seat back in January. And I succeeded in at least getting the current city council to take resumes and conduct interviews. However, an insider uh, from the party in power uh, still managed to get appointed and I wasn't even afforded an interview at that time, which is disappointing because I do want to ask for your votes, not just because I'm a Green Party candidate and not just because uh, we have a single party rule here in Syracuse, but because I do feel I'm the most qualified candidate on the ballot for this position. I have over 10 years of economic development experience with the Small Business Development Center at Onondaga Community College. I've got seven to eight years right now experience on the board of directors of Cooperative Federal Credit Union, uh, where I've been the president and chair of that board for the past five years, and which we manage $26 million in assets of the public's money here in the city of Syracuse, making loans to uh, family owners, uh, homeowners, uh, small businesses, et cetera, particularly in areas of the city that do not have uh, regular service from the major banks that currently already exist. And I'm on the streets and in the meeting room with groups such as TNT, OGs Against Gun Violence, Take Back the Street Initiative in the Near West Side, and the Alchemical Nursery Project community gardening work uh, that I currently do. I want to mention that the Syracuse uh, newspaper, The Post Standard, recently in an editorial uh, from their board, suggested that we need to be bold in Syracuse if we're gonna solve these solutions. And I posit to you that I'm the one to be bold in this city council seat and to make the arguments and to stand up for the decisions that need to be made in order to move us towards Syracuse that works for all of us. I've been positing these bold uh, proposals over the past couple of years as I've campaigned for myself and for others. Um, and just to mention a few of those. First off, uh, workforce development. Last year in the uh, race, one of my opponents argued that workforce development should not include business management. In other words, workforce development should only be skills and trades education. Well, we can see now that that, that is uh, changing because not only at the state level, but also at the federal level, we've had, excuse me, we've had uh, legislation passed that will increase the amount of technical assistance as well as access to loans for cooperative businesses, worker-owned, employee ownership, including ESOPs. Uh, the Main Street Employee Ownership Act that was passed at the federal level, that was uh, instituted by Senator Gillibrand, as well as the changes to, uh, a, state, um, to a state law that now increased the uh, opportunity for state funding for workforce development to go towards business management skills, which if you're opening up an employee-owned business or worker co-op, you need the skills 
and the trades uh, uh, skills, but you also need the ability to manage that business. Second, the um, appropriate response to the uh, harm that has been done by some of our police force to the residents of this city uh, has not been properly dealt with. The Citizens Review Board has found many instances of misconduct, yet the police chief and the city, including the council, have not spoken up uh, in, in, in response to that to make sure that they are appropriately um, uh, uh, dealt with in terms of not being allowed to be back on the street and continue to punish uh, the, the people that they are supposedly trying to serve. Now our council recently passed a, a retroactive budget for the Syracuse Police Department and a few of the councilors made statements and voted no against that, uh, particularly because there was a lack of awareness to the need for people of color uh, to be serving on that police force. But in the end, it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is if you're serving on that police force, if you still fail to serve appropriately and instead cause harm to the people that you're trying to serve. And lastly, in order to finance the changes that we need here, Howie mentioned quite a few initiatives at the state level that they would, uh, that would be undertaking that could help. Uh, I'm supporting the New York Health Act, Medicare for All bill, uh, during my campaigning here in Syracuse, but also continuing to speak out in favor of a 1% tax for uh, um, employees in the city of Syracuse so that we can maintain some of the finances that are leaving our city from uh, the folks who live in the suburbs but work in the city, mostly in the high paying eds and meds and other uh, good jobs. And we can use that money for our infrastructure as well as um, any other uses that we might see fit, including our school districts. And lastly, this afternoon here in the City Council Chambers, there will be a DPW committee meeting in which uh, plans for the winter and dealing with snow and the winter infrastructure environment here in Syracuse will be discussed. Uh, we've been waiting since February for a word on this since the mayor had the snow summit event, and that's way too long to be waiting to hear what a simple proposal is, which means that we're probably not gonna get a response and implementation for yet another winter season. It's another uh, item that I've been campaigning for and working for and petitioning for for the past couple of years as well to still see, continue to see the current council not actively take up that project. So again, I wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to speak today. I wanna um, ask that you please consider me for your vote because I am qualified for this position, I'm passionate for this position, and I can help uh, provide a Syracuse that works for everyone that lives here in Syracuse. Thank you. So questions? You mentioned this, uh, Howie, but what kind of opportunity is it now to have progressive, I mean, the nation is becoming more progressive, certain segments of the nation are becoming more progressive, probably as a reaction to the Trump administration policies. What kind of opportunity is there now for someone who's run for a number of offices at different levels to you know, grab those progressives? I think we're on the verge of a breakthrough because the polling shows the majority of people are progressive, particularly on the economic justice issues. It's been that way for a while, but people are now more independent of the two parties and saying they want a third party. And so sooner or later, we're going to break through. I don't know if it'll be this year. There is sort of, we got to vote Democrat to get back at Trump. He has brought those people out. There is a blue wave, but uh, we're saying, you know, if you're on the blue wave, the green wave's even better. And so that's what we're going to try to reach. I've been involved in movements since I was a teenager. We were a tiny minority when we started protesting the Vietnam War, and we ended up with a majority. Same with the anti-nuclear movement. When I helped organize the first occupations of Seabrook in 1976 and 77, we were 8%, according to public opinion polls, against nukes. Two years later, it was 80% in Rock Ridge, Republican, New Hampshire. Uh, we couldn't get movement on divestment and sanctions against South Africa until 1984. I helped put up a shanty town in the Green at Dartmouth College, and it exploded across the country. And within a year, Congress is overriding Reagan. And then the ban on fracking, man. I thought that was the hardest one we'd taken on yet. We had investors from Saudi Arabia to China. All you could hear on the financial channels was the shale play, all the Wall Street, Schumer, the whole establishment of both parties. And we created a movement that Cuomo could not ignore. And the reason he couldn't ignore it in the end 
because we got 5% of the vote in 2014. He wanted to roll up his vote so he could run for president. And he got less vote, lower percentage in 2014 than he had got in 2010. So he had to look, who are these people voting Greens and what do they want? We wanted a ban on fracking, paid family leave. We still want a $15 minimum wage. I hope I can get in the debate and say, Governor, where's my $15 minimum wage? Because he's running around saying, I got, we got a $15 minimum wage. We don't. The minimum wage is 1040. If I'm not governor, I go back to UPS. Another thing is they cut my pension 20%. It was a bipartisan change to the Employment, Retirement, Income Security Act. So the Treasury Department approved 20% cut. So the pension can dribble out the money a little longer. But I can go back as my consolation prize. I lose my seniority and I'll be unloading trucks for 1040 an hour. So governor, where's my $15? So I've been involved in a lot of movements and this third party movement, I think sooner or later is gonna break through. And I hope it's this year because we're running out of time. The climate crisis is not just a few heat waves and some you know, worse storms. It's undermining our basis to produce enough food to feed our people. People can't live in the zones where it's gonna get the hottest in the tropics. Mega droughts, food shortages, up to billions of environmental refugees. I mean, we're looking at an apocalyptic situation. And, you know, we got the so-called progressives back in the bill that doesn't deal with the problem. So we've got to get really serious. And the Greens are serious as a heart attack, and I hope people will see that in the election. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, question for Frank. Um, Syracuse was just tied for ninth, I think, for the uh, highest percentage of poverty oh, yeah. for a city in the nation. Yeah. Uh, what ideas would you bring to the Common Council to address that issue, to address that, uh, that new national ranking? Yeah, so certainly the uh, city of Syracuse needs to take some um, some giant leaps forward in some of the program developments and, and offerings that they are providing right now in Syracuse. It's kind of hard to get over the hump of the philanthropic uh, pr provision of the immediate needs of the people in Syracuse who are facing uh, these shortages of food and, and, and different issues. But uh, if we're going to succeed in the long run. What we need to do is create an economic development environment that will sustain assets within the city of Syracuse, within the ownership of the residents of Syracuse and the workers uh, of Syracuse. And that's done through a comprehensive employee ownership uh, workforce development program uh, that could easily be implemented. We've got technical assistance providers uh, throughout the city of Syracuse through organizations such as the Small Business Development Center that I work for, uh, Center State CEO, SCORE, the SSIC on the south side, uh, and if we can get the city to support these efforts for employee ownership and to do uh, public awareness and to bring uh, potential business conversions in because we are facing the retirement of the baby boom generation where currently 50% of the small business ownership is held. And what we don't want to see are those assets to be disinvested from the city uh, by competitors who liquidate them, nor do we want to see the jobs get lost if the business simply closes down, which we've seen many times over the course of history here in Syracuse. And so what we're looking at is a system change to the economic development uh, practices that we currently have in Syracuse combined with changes to what we've been doing, such as uh, reducing the amount of tax exemptions that the private developers are already getting, um, that just continues to create a divide between uh, the haves and have-nots here in Syracuse. So that would be my number one primary uh, initiative. All right, thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.